This morning, um, I, I was, this last week, um, I was getting a lot of things, because, you know, you pray for a message, and, and uh, I forget what day it was, Donna called, and she said the Lord told her to, to tell us to read, to tell us to read Psalm 29, and I said, okay, I did it, and it was about the voice of God, and and then uh, somebody else posted something about hearing God's voice. And so I said, well, that's a pretty good subject for a Sunday morning. I guess that's all right. Um, if you have your Bibles, and I'm going to be reading from the, uh, from the New King James this morning. I usually use King James, but don't tell anybody. Uh, it'll be mad at me. But uh, the New King James is a little bit more accessible to the 21st century uh, Christian. And um, this Bible, is a, is, this is a really nice Bible. John Passar gave it to me. He gave it to me. I said, John, that's a nice Bible. He says, well, somebody gave it to him. He said, he gave it away because he doesn't like the notes in it. I said, and they're pretty lousy notes, so I wouldn't recommend it to anybody. But, but the, the text is the same. Okay, so you, you don't, you know, uh, okay. We're talking about the voice of God. How many have heard this phrase? I know you all heard this phrase. There's a sucker born every minute. You ever hear that? You ever hear that? We all, we all heard that phrase, right? A lot of people think that uh, P.T. Barnum said that. Remember, P.T. Barnum was the circus guy. And he was noted for his sideshow. They, they, they would have these sideshows where they would say, uh, come and see uh, this uh, three-headed cow or something. And it would be something that they had made themselves. They just got some taxidermist. <laughs> so three heads on the cow and it would be there in a, in a bottle or a jar or something. And, and, and uh, he was notorious for, for uh, luring people in and taking their money. And when you think about it, he didn't say that, but somebody else said that about him, that he was, you know, he played on people's, uh, people's sensitivities. And, uh, but when you think about it, when, what do you see? What are, what's a commercial on TV? People trying to convince you to you, need to you need to buy something that you don't need and can't afford and, uh, and probably will regret after you get it. But, but that's what, you know, we, the, the, the voice, the words that we speak, we have a God who speaks to us. I thank God that we worship a God who has a voice. He has a voice. Uh, not just, you know, when we say, how do we hear from God? Well, we know the primary way we hear from God is through his word. That's uh, presented to us clearly. Uh, we were thankful that we have, in this nation anyway, I'm, I think the average house has like probably five Bibles in it. I don't know how many of them get read. But, uh, they, you know, he, his word is very clear. This, uh, showing who, who he is and what he does and what he expects from us and, and what, he, what he thinks is good and what he thinks is evil. And he's very clear about that. We've tried to reinterpret those words like they try to reinterpret the Constitution. They try to reinterpret the Bible to say stuff it doesn't say, but he's very clear about that. But I'm talking this morning not so much about what his word says. That's important. But when we hear, come on, have you ever heard from God? Now, we might not hear an, an actual voice, but have you ever had an inclination or something on the inside of you that's saying, listen, uh, this, is, this is what, if you're, I'm talking to saved people. If you're not saved, it doesn't, it doesn't happen like that. God does speak to unsaved people in certain ways. That's, that's something different. I'm talking to people that know the Lord. If you don't know the Lord, then we'll give you an opportunity to do that before we're done. But I'm talking to folks that say, I know Jesus. I'm born again and saved. I've got the Spirit of God dwelling inside of me. God will speak to you about certain things. Have you ever been in a situation and you say, God, what should I do? And you knew what to do. It wasn't, you know, something that somebody told you, something you could read in a book. But you knew that, that inclination, that leaning on the inside. Maybe you actually do hear a voice. But there's something inside that says, no, don't go there. No, don't do that. No, and, and, we, and, we, and we learn to follow. I've learned. There have been times that God has told me no, and I didn't think it was him because I couldn't understand why he would say no about this, and I found out it was him. Yeah, you'll find out if it's him. I thank God he's long-suffering and merciful. Uh, but I, I want to read just a little bit this morning about the voice of God, hearing the voice of God, because I don't want to be a sucker. I've been suckered in a few times in my life. Anybody else? Somebody asked me, somebody, somebody asked me, I believe, uh, they said, you know, when did religion start? I said, religion started when Eve believed the serpent, <laughs> right? I mean, she got suckered in, right? Yeah, but God won't, you, know, you won't die. God won't kill you. God, no, God just doesn't want you to be like him. So she believed. She bought, she bought, the, she bought the line, and uh, she got suckered in. The consequences, of course, are what we have now. But reading in Psalm 29, just read this a little bit with me. We're going to read a little bit about the voice of God, and we're going to look at a couple different places, okay? 
how God speaks. Now this of course is in the Old Testament. In the Old Testament they did not have the scriptural revelation that we have today. But it says this, Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones, give unto the Lord glory and strength. That means we don't give him strength, he already has a strength, but we own that he is, he is almighty. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name, worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. That's kind of what we do when we worship God and sing. That's why we open our services with music, songs and hymns and spiritual songs. And he says this, so all these, the next of these verses are the voice of the Lord. The, the word here, Lord, is the word Yahweh or Jehovah, the name of God. The voice of the Lord is over the waters. The, the, the God of glory thunders. His voice can be like thunder sometimes. It says, the Lord is over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. This is God's voice. This is when Isaiah, over in chapter 6, when he was taken up and he saw the Lord high and lifted up. And the angels were singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. And Isaiah was, he says, I'm undone because I'm a man of unclean lips. And I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And the angel came and put the coal on his lips. Then Isaiah heard the voice. After that cleansing came, he heard the voice where God said, who will go for us? And Isaiah said, I'll go. He heard the voice of God. It was like thunder. He says it was full of majesty. It was glorious above everything. The voice of the Lord. He says, the voice of the Lord breaks the cedars. Yes, the Lord splinters the cedars of Lebanon. It's powerful. There's nothing on earth that can withstand the voice of God. There's nothing in your life, in your situation, in your circumstance that can't withstand the voice of God. He says he makes them also like a calf. Uh, Lebanon and Syria and like a young wild ox. The King James says, Unicorn. Uh, they meant an animal with one horn, so don't get... Okay, all right. The voice of the Lord divides the flames of fire. I mean, this is the voice of God. The voice of the Lord shakes the wilderness. The Lord shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord gives deer, uh, makes the deer to give birth. It has life. It has power. It's thunder. It's glorious. It has life. This is in the Word of God, the voice of God. God spoke the Word. When he created the heavens and the earth, he spoke his word, his voice, created everything that we see. Just by his voice. Man, you want to hear his voice? It's powerful, it's mighty, it's glorious. He says, The voice of the Lord makes the deer give birth and strips the forest bare. And in his temple everyone says, Glory! Can we say glory? Glory! Right, hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Glory. I always wonder why folks did that. The first time I went to church, people were saying, glory. I said, well, why are they saying that for? Because it says it right here. Glory. <laughs> Hallelujah. All right. We say glory. Light, power, fire. The Lord sat enthroned at the flood, and the Lord sits as king forever. <laughs> he was in charge when he sent the waters on the earth to bring judgment to the earth. When Noah was here, and everybody was wicked, uh, continually, the thoughts of man was only wicked continually. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And Noah heard his voice. And his, he said, build an ark because I'm going to send judgment on the earth. And when he sent that flood, he was sitting on his throne. And he's sitting on his throne now. He'll give strength to his people. The people will bless him. The Lord will bless his people with peace. He'll give us strength. When you're going through the darkness, when you're going through the valley, when you're going through the heartbreak, whatever you're dealing with, when you're going through the fear of physical ailment, whatever it might be, he'll give you strength. The voice that created everything, the voice that thunders over all of creation, will give you the strength to deal with what you've got to deal with. He'll let you see his purpose. I thank God for Leo's uh, testimony he gave here a week or so ago about how he, God canceled his vacation. God sent him into a, a, a hospital with a possible heart attack just because there was a woman there that needed to hear the gospel. He saw his purpose. He heard his voice. He might not have understood at the time. Sometimes we don't understand at the time why things happen the way they happen. But God has a voice. He's in charge. He's in control. He's the king. 
Lord, why is our nation doing what it's doing right now? Why are we turning from, uh, from righteousness to sin? Why are, we, why are we accepting all this stuff that's going on right now? We have a Supreme Court that's letting anything happen. They're rewriting everything. They're trying to rewrite his word. I was, uh, 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 when uh, Chaplain Badama was here, he said, when you go into the Supreme Court building, they've got Ten Commandments all over the place. They, they want you to take them down. See, I don't know, you can say what you want to about our founding fathers and whatever, but one thing for sure is they believe that in the Ten Commandments. They might not believe everything else, but they believe in them. That covers a lot of ground. <laughs> the voice of God gave those Ten Commandments. He told Moses to write them. He told them what they were. Moses heard the voice. When he went up on that mountain with fire and smoke and everything going on, he heard the voice of God. I don't know if I want to hear the voice of God like that. Moses was a friend of God. Brother George sang that song. God took him, God let him see his glory, at least part of his glory. And when Moses would go into the tabernacle, he had to, he had to put a veil on his head because he was, he was glowing. He was so glorious because he'd been in the presence of God. And the people, they just couldn't stand to look at him because he was glowing so much, just like some of the folks around us. <laughs> they don't want to, but when we get in his presence, Moses took off the veil and he could, he could commune with God one-on-one, -on -one, hear his voice as a friend of God. I want you to look at another passage with me because I, I want you to understand that God does things in so many different ways. He does things in whatever way he wants to do them. Over in 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. It's uh, in the historical books of the Old Testament. And if you're familiar with this passage at all, it's, it's a story of Elijah. How many people know about Elijah, who Elijah was? Elijah was a prophet of God. He heard God's voice. God sent him to King Ahab, who was like one of the worst human beings that ever lived. Maybe second only to his wife, Jezebel. Okay. They were like two, I mean, like, they were two bad ones. And, and Elijah went to, to, to Ahab and said, it's not going to rain until I say so. And he went because Ahab was so wicked. He was a wicked king. And sure enough, it didn't rain. Well, at the end of that drought period, uh, Elijah, God told Elijah to go tell Ahab, I'm going to make it rain. And he did that. And he went up on Mount Carmel and he had a great victory where he killed all the prophets of Baal and so forth. And you read about that in the preceding the preceding chapters. And after Elijah had a great victory like that, man, a public, a public display of the power of God. He figured the whole place would get on their face and cry out and say, oh God, forgive us. But old Queen Jezebel, she said, Elijah, if you're around here tomorrow, you're going to be like them prophets you killed. Jezebel was not impressed. She was not impressed at the voice of God. <laughs> She was not impressed at the power and the miracles and the, and the great power, that went, the, the fire that came down. She wasn't impressed with that. So we read in chapter 19, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done in verse 1. Also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger, a messenger to Elijah saying, So let the gods do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. She said, Elijah, your days are up. So what did Elijah do? He started running started running. And he wasn't running because he was afraid of dying. We think, oh, Elijah he got scared of Jezebel because Jezebel, Jezebel was going to kill him. He didn't, run, he, didn't, he didn't run and hide for that reason. If you find out what happened, and we're going to read it, he, he ended up in, in, in a cave, maybe the same cave that Moses was in when he saw the glory. We're not sure. It was on Mount Horeb, which is Mount Sinai. It was the same place. And when he got there, he wasn't afraid of dying. He was just fed up. He was just frustrated. You ever get that way? You ever been talking to somebody for 20 years and you just get fed up? You think, aren't they listening? Aren't they hearing? He went, drop down to verse, uh, look, look at verse, uh, uh, we'll start with verse uh, 5, I guess. Is that verse 5? Okay. As he, as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. 
Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked of coals and so forth and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Horeb, the mountain of God, which is Mount Sinai. Okay? So he's up on Mount Sinai where Moses got the law, where Moses got the Ten Commandments. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. He heard God's voice. And he said unto him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Have God ever asked you, what are you doing here? When I first got saved, back in 83 or whatever it was, I told God I wasn't going to quit drinking. I just told him. I said, I wasn't an alcoholic. I wasn't driving drunk or nothing. I just said, I'm going to quit drinking. So I used to go hang out down at Legion, down, in, down on Constitution Boulevard, you know. That's where, that's where I would hang out. So I'd, I'd go in, I w and it was a couple months, and I went in there, and God said, what are you doing here? <laughs> Has God ever said that to you? <laughs> what are you doing here? What are you doing watching that? What are you doing with that music on your radio? Okay. He said, he said what are you doing here, Elijah? Verse 10. So he said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. And that, that was true. Elijah was on fire for God. He said, I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. That's, that's true. And he says, I alone am left. That's not quite true, but we're going to see in a minute. He says, I alone am left, and they seek to kill me. He's putting his hands up and saying, God, what do I got to do? You had fire come down. I mean, the fire came down and took up the sacrifices, and there was this great display of your power and your glory, and they still hate you, and they still want to kill me. What do I got to do? you ever feel that way? What do I got to do to get through to this kid? What do I got to do to get through to this? Okay. Then he said, God said to Elijah, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. There's a big wind. You get a, like a big tornado coming. Sounded like a freight train, except he wouldn't know what a freight train was. Sounded like a freight train. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind and earthquake, shaking, you know, we just read about how, how the voice of God shakes. But the Lord wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake of fire, glory, we just read about that in Psalm 29, his glory, his voice, his glory, fire, light. But the Lord wasn't in the fire. And after the fire, came a still, small voice. See, God can speak in thunder, he can speak in wind, he can speak in fire, or he can speak in a whisper. The still small voice came. So it was when Elijah heard it, he knew it was the voice of God. He wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. I, I wish I could have seen this. I love Elijah. Suddenly, a voice came to him again. Here's the voice of God, and it's the same question. You know, when God asks a question, he usually knows the answer. I always say that. Whenever God asks a question, he already knows the answer. But he wants to hear what we think. What are you doing here, Elijah? He asked them that before. And Elijah repeated the same answer. I've been very zealous for, now he got the, his mantle wrapped around his head. I have I've been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down. He probably had this thing rehearsed for 40 days, what he was going to say to God. Your altars and you killed your prophets with a sword. I am alone, I'm left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, here's his voice. Go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus, and when you arrive, anoint Hazael as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel. Uh, Jehu ended up killing uh, Ahab and uh, Jezebel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of uh, um, this name, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. So he's saying, uh, I'm, I got your replacement <laughs> lined up. Anoint him and do these other things. Then he says this. And it shall be, 
Uh, it shall be that whosoever escapes the sword of Hezekiel, Jehu will kill, and whosoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet, now here, 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 here it comes. Yet, he says, I have reserved, God, this is God speaking, the voice of God. I have reserved 7,000 in Israel. Elijah, you're not the only one left. You're not the only one standing for righteousness. Christian, you're not the only one in the United States of America that is grieved. He says, I got a bunch of you. I got a bunch of them. I got people everywhere. It doesn't matter who's sitting in the White House. God got his people. It doesn't matter what a bunch of judges say. God got his, God got his people everywhere. He got them in China. He got them in Africa. He got them in Syria. He got them in Iraq and Iran. He got them in Pakistan. He got them in the United States. He even got them in New Kensington. He got them everywhere. So, we see the voice of God, thunder, lightning, glory, fire. We see the voice of God in a still, small voice. How can we know the difference? Because sometimes God will speak to you in an earthquake. Sometimes he'll speak to you in a whisper. How many know what I'm talking about? Sometimes it's just a little voice in here. Sometimes it's a blast from the radio. I mean, some, yeah, he, can, he can speak to us any way he wants to. The thing is, how can we tell the difference? Because there's a lot of voices. There's a lot of voices with collars on. There's a lot of voices with a cross on the wall. Man, you got 200 channels. There's a lot of voices everywhere. <laughs> how do we know? How can we tell? If I stand up here and say something, and you listen to that, say, Pastor Carmel, what are you talking about? How do you, how, is, is, it, is it my voice? Is it God's voice? When you hear a preacher on TV, when you hear somebody, is it, how, do, how can we discern? This is for the believer. If you're not a believer, forget it. You can't discern anything. I want you to look with me in the New Testament in a couple passages. Okay? Uh, Quickly, one that we spoke on here just a few weeks ago, John chapter 12, John's Gospel chapter 12. And uh, <clears throat> look at verse, uh, we'll, we'll start with verse 23. We'll read a little bit. We've got some time. And this was just a couple days before his crucifixion. And there's, there's a lot of activity. It's the Passover time in Jerusalem. There's a lot of people there from other nations, Jews from other lands that came to worship God. So there's a lot going on. It's a very busy time there. There were some folks that wanted to see Jesus. And Jesus answered them saying in verse 23, the hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. And when we talked about this a few weeks ago, they were thinking, well, he's ready to be the king, right? Because that's what they were expecting. Most assuredly, I say to you, Jesus said, unless a grain of wheat falls into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who loves his life will lose it. And he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. Where he leads me, I will... I didn't tell George to sing that song. Okay, I didn't. If anyone serves me, let him follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. So Jesus says, I'm getting ready to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Will you follow me? I'm getting ready to go to the cross. Will you follow me? They didn't know that at that time. But that's what he's saying. Follow me. They're hearing his voice. It says in verse 27, Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. I came to this point in my life. I came to this, 
to this earth. I was incarnated as a human being, God in the flesh, for one purpose, and the purpose is coming, and just a, a day or two away. I, I was incarnated in the flesh to die on the cross. That's my own, that was his only reason for coming here. He didn't come here to heal people. He didn't come here to, to put on his shows and do miracles. He came here to die for the sin of the world. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He said, that's why I came. When he said, Father, glorify your name, becomes the voice. The voice. The voice of the Lord. The voice in Psalm 29. The still small voice of, uh, that Elijah heard. Here comes the voice. The voice came from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. Thank the Lord. Can we say in what we're going through right now that God is going to be glorified? Oh, God can't be glorified in the mess I'm in. Listen, he was getting ready to go to the cross. He was getting ready to die. He was talking about glory. His disciples didn't understand anything about that. Listen. Here's what it said. Therefore, the people that stood by and heard it said that it had thundered. Some heard it. Some heard the thunder. Others said, an angel has spoken to him. See, I wonder if the ones who were really following him heard it and said, wow, that's God. And the ones who were like, kind of like this, well, man, it's thunder. I, I don't know. I'm reading that into it. Please don't. Listen to what Jesus said. Jesus answered and said, this voice did not come because of me. God didn't have to convince Jesus. But for your sake, now is the judgment of this world. Now the ruler of this world will be cast out. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all men unto me. We don't got to put on any kind of big show. We don't got to... <laughs> If we lift up Jesus, he'll draw a man to him. If we lift up the light of Christ, if we lift up the glory of God, if they hear his voice, he'll draw a man. Some will stay, some will leave. But ain't nobody going to draw people to God except Jesus Christ. It's only him. He said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men unto me. The people answered, Him. We have heard from the law that Christ remains forever. How can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? They understood what he was saying. Who is this Son of Man? Then Jesus said to them, A little while longer the light is with you. Walk while you have the light, lest darkness overtake you. He who walks in darkness does not know where he's going. While you have the light, believe in the light, that you may become sons of the light. This, these things Jesus spoke and departed and was hidden from them. He said, Listen, today is the day of salvation. They were hearing his voice. Some people responded, some people didn't. Now somebody said, well, that's still, how does that, how does that, how do I know? I want to tell you something. You'll never know the voice of God until you know him. You've got to know him. People try to, they want to hear from God, but they, they don't know him. If, it's like, you know, I know, I know my wife's voice. I know her pretty well. We've been together almost 30 years. I know when she's happy. I know when she isn't. I know when she's mad. <laughs> how, how many people know what I'm talking about? You can tell from their voice. And she can do the same with me. You can hear their voice and say, uh-oh. <laughs> or you can say, uh-oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. Because I know her. We know each other. Family members, people you've known for years and years, you could tell. One more passage and we're going to close, okay? Over in John chapter 10, just a couple pages. Listen. You got to know him. See, if you know him, if you, if you know him, not know about him, if you know him, you'll recognize his voice. Whether it's a thunder or whether it's a whisper,
Jesus says, if he, the, the chapter before this is when he healed the blind guy and they threw the guy out because he got healed and they didn't want to admit that it was Jesus that did it. He says, most assuredly I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. He's using the, uh, the imagery of a shepherd in a, in a, sheep, a, a, a sheep floor, like where they would keep him, like a, a corral. But he who enters in by the door of the shepherd uh, uh, is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the sheep hear his voice, and when he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. You can't know his voice until you know him. People want to hear from God. I had a fellow tell me, well, I go to church because I want to learn about God. Okay. So I told him, but God thinks about the same-sex marriage thing. He says, I ain't coming to your church. I said, well, you want to find out what God says? <laughs> Do we hear his voice? Do you know him? See, that's the bottom line. That's why I tell folks all the time, you've got to get this relationship right before any other relationship. If, you don't got, if you're not satisfied with this relationship, if you're, not, listen, if you're not hearing God with this relationship, you're going to be confused about everything else. If you try, if you try to play the Christian game, Just reading a little bit more. Verse 4. And when he brings out his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet they will by no means follow a stranger, but will flee from him. Sad to say, that's, it's not the same testimony with a lot of believers. For they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this illustration, but they did not understand the things which he spoke. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters in by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Listen, if, you, if you're hearing voices and you're hearing something, listen, you need, you need to understand. If you have a relationship, a right relationship with God, and you put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior solely that you know you're saved only because of what he did then you can know you can listen I, I want to tell you something if, if it's the voice of God he's going to affirm you he's not going to destroy you he's going to build you up not tear you down he's going to expose sin but he'll never condone it he's going to correct you but he will not punish See, we got this idea that God's sitting up there, he's a big grandpa, and whenever he speaks, he's going to be, hey, that's okay. No, sometimes he doesn't say that. Matter of fact, most of the time he doesn't say that. But he doesn't do it to punish. He does it to encourage us to live a life of righteousness and holiness. It's glorifying to him. We live in a world now, there's so many voices that will tell you, God doesn't care about that. God, now God, he doesn't care about that. This old Jimmy Carter said, man, God would approve of this uh, same-sex stuff. <laughs> Jesus would go along with that. I don't know where he comes. I don't know what Bible he reads. He's not hearing the same voice I'm hearing. The voice of God will encourage and not discourage. The voice of God will focus on Christ and not on self. The voice of God will bring peace and not fear. If you know him, You'll know his voice because it's the voice of the shepherd. The shepherd doesn't want to destroy his sheep. The shepherd doesn't want to lead his sheep off a cliff. The shepherd defends his sheep. Our shepherd, our good shepherd, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not afraid. It looks bad. Some of you all looking around, you're looking at your circumstances, and it looks bad. Jesus has been there before. You got a broken heart. Jesus has been there before. 
You're hurting. You're, you're crying out. You're, unsure, you're, uh, you're, you're unsure of what the future holds. Jesus, well, he, was always, he knew what the future held. But listen, he's been there before. He's been where you're headed. Wherever it might be. It might be desertion. He was deserted. Maybe somebody slandering you. He was slandered. They said all kinds of stuff about him. God knows what that's all about. When you hear his voice, listen, when he speaks to you, it'll never be to condemn. It might be to convict, but never to condemn. It'll always be to lift you up and build you up and make you more of a child of God than you were yesterday. Everything you go through, believe me, everything that happens in your life, as horrible as it may seem, it may even be consequences of something you had done yesterday or a year ago or 20 years ago. It might even be been, uh, results of bad decisions you have made. God will take it and use it for your benefit. For the word of God is given to reproach and to instruct in righteousness. That's what he wants. He wants us to be light in the middle of darkness. And he wants us to make, he wants to make us the people that he wants us to be. When we hear his voice. Have you heard his voice? Have you heard his voice? Maybe you've heard the thundering. Maybe you've, you've heard the voice of a catastrophe. Maybe you heard a voice of a stirring in your heart. Whatever it might be, if you're his, he's speaking to you for a reason. He wants to make you, conform you into the image of his son. What does it say over there in Romans chapter 8? We all, we've quoted it so many times, sometimes we get sick of quoting it. But we need to understand what it says. All things work together for the good of them that love God. Oh wait, don't stop. And are called according to his purpose. To conform us, to, 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 to take the next verse now, to, to conform us to the image of his dear son. Going through the fire can be painful. Going through the judgment. Going through the darkness. Going through the valley is scary. But God's with us. Have you heard his voice? I hope, I hope you hear his voice this morning. I need to hear a little bit of his voice this morning too. I'm going to ask you to stand, George. Could you come and play that, play that again, okay? Where he leads me, I will follow. If he's leading you this morning, I'm going to ask you to come, and I'm going to ask Brother Jairus and Brother Leo to come, and we'll pray. If Brother John wants to come up, and we'll, we'll be happy to pray with you. You don't, even, you don't have to tell us where he's leading you. It's not important. But if he's, if he's leading you, and maybe he's leading you someplace that doesn't look up like a place you want to go. But you've heard his voice and you know it's his voice. We want to encourage you and pray with you. Won't you come that we might pray with you? Whatever it might be, won't you come that we might pray with you? Go ahead, George.